Thank you very much. My name is Don Lowe. I'm a thoracic surgeon at Virginia Mason. Very pleased to be given the opportunity to introduce my friend and partner, uh, Dr. Misha Hupka. And Dr. Hupka, uh, first of all, is an outstanding example of a superb clinician and surgeon uh, that is a regular product of our Virginia Mason training program, having done his general surgical training uh, at Virginia Mason. He then completed his cardiothoracic training at the University of Washington, and I can uh, say that we are extremely lucky that we were able to lure him back from the university as a staff member of Virginia Mason. In a profoundly short period of time, uh, he has risen through the ranks of the uh, both administrative and clinical um, aspects of Virginia Mason and is now a section head of thoracic surgery and deputy chief of surgery. He is a superb technical surgeon. Uh, he has introduced and promulgated one of now the most successful robotic thoracic surgical programs uh, within the United States. And he has a wide variety of interests in both academic and clinical surgery and thoracic surgery. His uh, rather euphemistically entitled uh, talk today is going to be fascinating to everyone who has the opportunity to hear it because it is going to be a very granular and specific example of what separates Virginia Mason from our regional competitors regarding the services we offer and the excellence that's associated with those services. So it's with great pleasure that I turn the situation over to Dr. Hubka. Uh, Don, thank you very much for the kind words. Um, as you are introducing me, I almost disconnected my computer from power, which would have uh, change the tone of this morning's presentation. Uh, I will start sharing my slides with all of you. And thank you very much for being here. Can, uh, can you guys see my slides? Excellent. Uh, so we'll get started. And uh, <clears throat> the topic of this morning, uh, of this morning's presentation is uh, embracing complexity. I think we all recognize that um, uh, in the recent past, uh, uh, our, our exposure to the pandemic has been a catalyst to, uh, to uh, worsen complexity uh, in our day-to-day -day interaction. In fact, Dr. Lowe, who just introduced me, is sitting uh, 10 feet away from me in his own office, and we are all uh, 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 doing it this way because we are trying to be responsible and, um, and get back to some form, form of normal. However, the technology, the Zoom technology we are using yeah. is also enabling us to, uh, to do this. Otherwise, there would be no grand round. So uh, this presentation uh, will be in that theme. Uh, in thoracic surgery, uh, we um, care for a wide variety of, uh, of uh, disease processes of the lungs, pleura, the esophagus, and the stomach. Uh, the chest wall, and the mediastinum. These range from uh, benign and malignant problems, problems that require a simple uh, preoperative visit with a definitive uh, procedure and a single postoperative visit, but also problems that require complex surgical treatment, and, uh, and the, that surgical pre treatment is preceded by uh, a number of visits with multiple tests, retests, uh, uh, biopsies, etc. Uh, when people think about surgery, they always think about the operating room and the act of surgery, but there is much more to carrying out successful uh, patient, surgical patient care than just the uh, uh, operation itself. Here you see us uh, uh, positioning the patient. You will appreciate the control chaos in the, of the operating room with multiple moving hands on the patient and uh, progressing the operation, minimizing the uh, operative time, and uh, obviously subsequently minimizing patient's morbidity and enhancing recovery. If I fast forward, you'll see the patient is draped. Uh, we then subsequently place, make little holes and place ports in the patient's chest, and then dock this um, uh, apparatus, uh, the surgical robot over the patient, allowing us to perform the operation. This has implications on uh, very many positive implications on the patient's recovery and outcomes, but it also has some implications on teamwork, interaction of the team, um, uh, and 
other things that we will cover this morning. Uh, when we, uh, when I think of how uh, we deliver thoracic surgery in the 21st century, uh, I really um, uh, uh, reflect on on uh, the importance of patient-centered care. It is uh, this uh, uh, trifecta of patient-centered care, innovation, education, uh, and outcomes and research uh, really mirrors our organizational. Um, uh, priorities and our organizational values at Virginia Mason and now Virginia Mason Franciscan Health um, and, uh, and, and guides our approach to everything that we do. That is, of course, uh, not just done on an uh, on a, 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 on a, uh, intuitive basis, but rather driven by a data-centered approach to all the aspects of uh, uh, the complex care that we are able to provide. Uh, in 2018, um, I would like to, well, first I would like to give a shout out to Karen Fowler. Karen is a, a, one of our wonderful uh, computer analysts, and uh, in 2018, uh, just prior to me taking over the leadership in the, in, uh, the thoracic surgical section, uh, Karen um, was able to build me a dashboard which tracks our outcomes and allow us to, allows us to, to uh, improve on ongoing uh, in ongoing fashion. As you appreciate, uh, the, 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 the data that we are tracking is over the past five years and started really in January of, uh, on January 1st, 2016. Uh, since then, we have performed 2,616 operations uh, uh, for uh, 1,158 uh, ICU days, over 11,500 patient days in the hospital. Uh, we track our Medicare and all payer readmission rates. We track our uh, readmission uh, um, uh, um, patterns over time. And we also track our length of stay. And as you can see, our length of stay has gradually decreased since 2016 to 2021. Um, and uh, that uh, has uh, um, been really a product of long-term uh, historical efforts uh, of improving patients' outcome, patients' outcomes here at Virginia Mason. We will also uh, discuss uh, the inflection of, uh, of decreased length of stay and what it has to, and, and, and its implications on readmission and what we do about uh, minimizing readmission rates, which can be costly both to the patients and the organization. We can track uh, our patient outcomes in a very granular way. Here you can see Another type of analysis that we routinely perform, which uh, has to do with uh, uh, patients' uh, pain scores, uh, and that is uh, um, uh, as related to not only post-operative day, uh, uh, the day of surgery, but also post-operative day uh, one, and the ratio of pain on the day of surgery and discharge. As you can see, despite decreasing length of stay, um, our pain scores have not really improved over time, and that is an area of uh, current uh, uh, research efforts, but it's also a reflection of our uh, changing needs. Uh, most of the pain we were, uh, in, in the past, we managed as uh, uh, on inpatient basis as patients would stay in the hospital longer, but now we have to leverage our outpatient teams to, um, to engage in a more uh, granular management of pain uh, to prevent readmissions or other adverse outcomes. So how do patients move through our system? Well, a patient enters through some form of initial encounter. An initial encounter uh, is either in-person or virtual these days. And again, I, uh, despite all the um, challenges uh, uh, brought, uh, brought on by the pandemic, I think uh, we certainly um, uh, enjoy the rapid uh, adoption of, of uh, virtual care as it is not only uh, good for our patients but also minimizes their uh, travel burden uh, to for preoperative workup. Then at some point though the patient does have to embark on an in-person visit uh, for their preoperative outpatient encounter and testing and uh, then proceeds with an inpatient recovery uh, followed by an outpatient recovery and eventually leaves our system 
uh, of uh, specialty care to their primary care provider or specialist who specialist who send the patient to us. So let's learn a little bit about our, our patients. This is a, um, a map of patient encounters from 2016. And as you can see, we treat not only regional patients in Washington, but also in Idaho, Oregon, Montana, uh, South, uh, Southeast Alaska, and Alaska proper. Um, and if you fast forward now to 2021, uh, you will appreciate that uh, this uh, map is much denser with greater presence in Alaska, but also our neighboring states. Who is the patient we take care of? Well, the patient has some sort of a disease state, uh, and really I, I, I uh, uh, showed you the list, the, the, the kind of complex list of, of, uh, of uh, pathologies that we, we um, take care of, but it is in the context of their physiology, of their comorbidities, of their health literacy, of their social support and ability to travel, of their access to technology and technological literacy. The last two bullet points, I would say, we would never speak of as of a year ago, but again, the ongoing changes in our ability to engage patients and for patients to enter uh, our system uh, made these two aspects of the patient's background much more important. When we look at uh, the initial encounter, we uh, see patients both enter our system both as inpatient and outpatient. We try to do in thoracic surgery in general, and I think in healthcare in general, accessing the healthcare system through an inpatient encounter is, um, is complex uh, and it's oftentimes not appropriate. There are uh, disease processes like esophageal perforation, empyema, through which patients uh, have to enter the, the healthcare system by an inpatient encounter but we do everything in our power to, uh, to have the patients enter uh, on outpatient basis. Uh, this is done through various screening efforts uh, to detect disease processes early, like lung cancer screening or screening for Barrett's esophagus and early esophageal cancer. Uh, and then once they enter our system, we try to do that in a coordinated fashion. We do so because when you see a thoracic surgeon, you don't really just ever really see a thoracic surgeon. You see a myriad of specialists who work together. Uh, uh, in thoracic surgery, we routinely interact with our radiology colleagues, our gastroenterology and pulmonary colleagues, other surgical specialties in, with whom we work in, with, with closely, uh, otolaryngology, uh, uh, preoperative testing with uh, uh, cardiology, and obviously medical and radiation oncology. As you can imagine, this complex uh, um, uh, uh, series of encounters that our patients usually have to embark on can uh, result in significant uh, number of visits and burden to the patient. We actually have examined this in the past. This was pre-pandemic where we looked at uh, what are the patient-related burdens uh, with um, workup and, 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 and workup leading to surgical treatment of primary lung cancer. We looked at how much the patients have to travel, how many encounters uh, they have to undergo to get to surgery for lung cancer care, and then also do any of these drive delays in care. We have benchmarks for every aspect of our practice that we are trying to meet on an ongoing basis. And uh, looking at these patient populations, we saw that the urban patients uh, uh, have median uh, seven uh, healthcare encounters and has to travel about 100 miles. Rural patients actually have more encounters and have to travel on average 385 miles. And regional patients from other states oftentimes travel well over 700, almost 800 miles for 10 healthcare encounters at Virginia Mason prior to proceeding with curative attempt um, pulmonary resection. This can delay their time to surgery, and as you can see, it can be de delay our benchmark uh, 14 days by 21% in the urban patients, 152% in rural, and 162% in regional patients. That gave us, uh, this type of analysis gives us an understanding of the current state 
an opportunity for improvement. Really, this uh, type of improvement has started under the guidance of Dr. Lowe in the past, who understood the importance of cancer coordination, was really the first cancer surgeon at Virginia Mason to engage uh, a, an esophageal cancer coordinator. Since then, we have lung cancer screening coordinators, we have coordinators for lung cancer care, we have a thoracic surgery nurse practitioner who is the liaison between inpatient and outpatient uh, management, and we have a thoracic surgical physician assistant who not only assists us with complex robotic operations, but also assures that uh, inpatient uh, recovery protocols are administered, as we will discuss just in a few minutes. The pandemic changed how we administer multidisciplinary care, and we have to very quickly transition from in-person multidisciplinary review to virtual multidisciplinary review, similar to these grand rounds. We, were, we then looked at uh, and published on how effectively we were able to do that. We had a wonderful medical student, Eric Stiles, who was working with us that month, and he looked at our rates of uh, uh, patients presented our multidisciplinary nodule board before and during the pandemic and the process of transitioning to a, uh, to a virtual-based multidisciplinary review. And as you can see, within two weeks, we were completely able to transition, uh, transition to uh, virtual presentation. Uh, and a lot of kudos and admiration is to be given to our pathologists, our radiologists, our medical and radiation oncologists who prepare for these conferences. And oftentimes, uh, a conference which takes about two hours really requires about eight to 10 hours of preparation uh, by these teams. So now let's discuss something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the inpatient encounter and how we innovate and, uh, and uh, optimize inpatient and operative care. And this really is the fundamental base of our, our value triangle where we look at our outcomes via ongoing research uh, and where we you know, innovate and educate our residents. Innovation and education is really in the context of history of uh, thoracic surgery at Virginia Mason. And really, I would uh, be remiss if I did not uh, highlight uh, Lucius Hill, who I never had the opportunity to meet, but who was a real surgical innovator, describing the Hill repair and really um, uh, adding to our understanding of the esophagogastric junction, its pathology, and treatments. I um, would say that the, the, the foundation that Lucius Hill built at Virginia Mason uh, really uh, skyrocketed into a, a pillar of uh, esophageal surgery wo worldwide. And uh, Don, who introduced me today, um, really is, is, is the father of enhanced recovery uh, after esophageal surgery worldwide. Don wrote the guidelines for enhanced recovery after surgery uh, for esophagectomy. He also uh, led international efforts to gain consensus in standardization of data collection and complications following esophagectomy. And that has led to not only many academic accolades, but recognition uh, of Virginia Mason and putting Virginia Mason on the map with respect to esophageal surgery and thoracic surgery and will be forever indebted to him for his efforts. Don, uh, uh, Don's outcomes uh, were so good that in fact, um, we had a number of groups from not only the US but all around the world uh, visit Virginia Mason to learn from us, learn our pathways, and then go to their home institution and, and their respective countries and uh, enable their uh, enhanced recovery and improve their outcomes by by implementing those pathways. It was also the dominant driver behind uh, an international esophageal database called esodata.org, uh, where, where he partners with our other partner, Dr. Kupasami, who is a real um, uh, wizard when it comes to databases and has engaged a number of uh, um, centers worldwide for now over 10,000 esophagectomies recorded in this database. So when we talk about benchmarking of, of outcomes, 
and improvements in our enhanced recovery pathways and innovation, we have to remember that it's all in the context of the work that has been done here before and the culture uh, of not only surgeons, but the intraoperative nursing support, uh, clinic support, and our inpatient nursing support who are all trained in uh, enhanced recovery. So when we talk about recent innovation to further enhance our, our uh, clinical outcomes and patient-centered uh, recovery, we have to talk about robotics and uh, the, the robotic technology. The surgical robot, as some of you may know, uh, is a uh, ever so uh, uh, more predominant part of uh, surgical care and really has in the recent years entered uh, uh, as, a, as a dominant driver of, of improved outcomes in thoracic surgery. The surgical robot, um, uh, the, dominant, the dominant producer of a surgical robot is uh, Intuitive Surgical. And the first robot was uh, designed in uh, 1999. And in fact, one of our former graduates, Fred Moll, was intimately uh, intimately uh, uh, involved in, 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 in driving these efforts. As you can see, the robotic system over the past uh, two decades has undergone an evolutionary, series of evolutionary improvements. And really, it was not until 2014 where the LAS system, the, the, what we call the XI system, has uh, entered the marketplace. Uh, the previous systems were not uh, designed uh, or did not have a very high uh, safety profile to implement them in thoracic surgery and was mainly because when we operate on our patients, as you saw in the initial video, the patient is oftentimes in a lateral decubitus position and uh, uh, there were times when the patient's head had to be away from uh, our anesthesia teams in order to dock the surgical robot and uh, we use special double lumen type tubes to be able to isolate uh, the, uh, the lung, the, the operative lung, and as you can, as you can imagine, uh, there will be many problems with lack of access uh, to the patient's airway by our anesthesia teams. So in, a, so in 2017, we embarked on uh, implementation of the robotic thoracic uh, surgical program here at Virginia Mason. Our number one priority was uh, safety. Uh, I'm very proud to say that we have had no intraoperative mortalities and no severe intraoperative uh, adverse uh, events uh, necessitating uh, emergent uh, uh, conversion to an open operation, which is actually quite unique uh, among uh, thoracic robotic programs nationwide. We did so by, by incremental increase in the complexity of work we do. We first embarked on simulation with the system and then proceeded with a series of uh, level one cases prior to proceeding with more complex operations. Now, in thoracic surgery, because of the nature of the uh, geographic location where we operate, all operations take uh, place near the heart, the mediastinal and pulmonary vasculature, and so the risk for, for uh, uh, an intraoperative adverse event is always there. As such, we made sure that we, our staff, which is a specialized and dedicated staff that work, work with us, is, uh, has undergone uh, a simulation training for an intraoperative adverse event. We hired a dedicated bedside assistant. We embarked on a very structured resident education so we can uh, extend uh, uh, not only the benefit to our patients but to our residents in whom uh, the uh, surgical robotics will be part of their practice. And then, as with other aspects of our care, we continue to uh, evaluate our outcomes uh, on an ongoing basis by uh, routinely interrogating our, our databases and our, uh, our dashboard. And finally, uh, we were able to onboard new surgeons without sacrificing outcomes uh, for our patients. So when we talk about robotics, we, uh, you have to realize that the surgeon, uh, the operative, operative surgeon is actually not scrubbed. There is a, there is a bedside team that, that is uh, exchanging instruments, and the surgeon is seated at a console and uh, operates using both his, hand, his or her hands and feet. Uh, there are four, four robotic arms in the newest system, so 
So there are two right, I usually have two right hands, one left hand, and a um, camera which allows me to see things very, very, very uh, sharply. So the surgeon and the robot, which is uh, 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 depicted here in the center, is really off, um, off center, and, is, and the patient is really surrounded by the physician's assistant, a surgical trainee, anesthesia trainee, the anesthesiologist. This team is then further supported by the anesthesia technician and a scrap technician. And finally, uh, there is the circulating nurse in the room. All the movement and performance of the team is really impacted on how the room is set up, and the efficiency of the day is impacted by the, by the room turnover. As you can imagine, this is a quite complex system which requires um, a very clear set of uh, um, uh, uh, rules and game plan to execute it successfully. As such, we uh, are very lucky because our organization, uh, our periop services at that point were led by John Corman, who does robotic surgery himself, understood the importance of specialized teams. We uh, have a very uh, defined way we communicate in the operating room. As you can imagine, if the surgeon is bedside with the patient, there is a lot of nonverbal communication that can go on and also a lot of uh, a very um, uh, acute uh, change in what's happening with the patient can be, uh, can be affected by the surgeon. However, with the surgeon elsewhere uh, and away from the patient, there are other safety uh, uh, measures that we had to undertake. We try to minimize distractions, people coming in and out of the operating room, we have uh, contingency plans. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, one of the small things, for example, is that we always have a gown and gloves ready for the operating surgeon just in case there has to be an emergent conversion uh, to an open or videoscopic uh, type uh, uh, procedure to, to stop uh, an adverse event. Uh, we, um, we, have that, we have that one little safety check. So here uh, you will see me sitting at the robotic console. And what I'll instruct the team to exchange an instrument, a bipolar grasper, for a vessel sealer. You see the surgical robot. You can see Ali, our assistant, and one of our resident trainees. And Ali is instructing me that she's indeed exchanged the instrument. She gives me a recall, and I give her a verbal acknowledgement that the instrument exchange happened, and then keep going with the operation. So let me talk a little bit about uh, resident education. Uh, our residents have a very prescribed uh, and, and well-defined curriculum. I have to give a... a uh, I have to acknowledge our residency program director, Dr. Lily Chang, who is a real visionary and supporter of our residents, and also Dr. Val Simiano, who leads our uh, robotic program. And we have uh, standardized the type of education for our residents for various operations. Here is a, uh, uh, pro a resident progression of our robotic uh, hiatal or parasophageal hernia repair. As you can see, they have to undergo simulation training and have to achieve at least 90% score on the console uh, uh, prior, to, prior to proceeding uh, with intraoperative engagement with the patient. The intraoperative engagement with the patient is then a phased approach through phases one, two, and three, where phase three really requires fellowship training. So our residents are usually in the phase one and phase two parts of their learning, and, and um, is, 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 is really uh, includes a gradual uh, uh, um, addition of responsibility with uh, understanding how to use uh, one or two instruments, then understand how to uh, manipulate tissues, then we uh, have them start using a third arm, and we under understand how repositioning of the third arm has implications on tissue tension, exposure, and collisions between the arms which can happen outside the patient. And uh, we have been very successful in engaging our residents who I believe will be prepared for uh, practice with uh, surgical robotics in their own uh, institutions after graduation. 
So every surgeon, uh, when they give a talk, likes to show you a case. And really, uh, this is something that I, uh, a case we did with uh, one of our graduating chiefs, Elizabeth Carlson, is a case of esophageal lyomyoma. And the reason why I did not pick a, a, a lobectomy or an esophagectomy, uh, because those are the most two common operations we do, but this uh, um, uh, treatment of esophageal lyomyoma in a nice uh, young woman uh, who uh, presented to our department with dysphagia or trouble swallowing uh, really highlights the not only surgical robotics, but highlights the various minimally invasive uh, techniques we can use in one patient to not only save her esophagus, but to minimize morbidity associated with surgery. Here you will see the patient's CT scan, and on the CT scan you can see the windpipe, the lungs, and the very small donut right here is the esophagus. The esophagus has a, a tumor in its wall. It's a benign tumor called the lyomyoma. It arises from the patient's uh, esophageal smooth muscle. And as you can see, it's very evident why it's causing her troubles swallowing and also uh, uh, periodic aspirations and troubles with pneumonia. So she's uh, then worked out with a CT scan and obviously has to have a patient visit for that when we talk about burden related to workup. Then undergoes a, an upper endoscopy by, by our GI colleagues and you can very clearly see that there's a tumor which is not invading into the esophagus but uh, is part of the esophageal wall and is causing a partial obstruction. Uh, you can see the mass on the endo on endoscopic ultrasound and here we embark on the operation. We first make an incision in the patient's uh, neck, just above the breastbone, and place a scope just in front of the windpipe. That procedure is called mediastinoscopy. That is done to not only mobilize the tumor uh, off of the windpipe, but, but to identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is a nerve that goes to the patient's voice box, and the vagus nerve on the left, because uh, uh, the vagus nerve, a division of both vagus nerves can, can uh, lead to problems with uh, gastric emptying postoperatively. You can see we are carefully dissecting both nerves and mobilizing, uh, mobilizing the esophagus and the tumor off of the mediastinal vascular structures and the windpipe. So let's fast forward to now looking uh, through the patient's right chest. Uh, we have made five little cuts on the patient's right chest we have uh, two arms, we got, you cannot see our second right arm. Uh, you can see here is the azygous arch, which is draining into the superior vena cava. Uh, here is the phrenic nerve. And here in the posterior mediastinum, you will see the, obviously the esophagus with a bulging tumor. And here is the windpipe. The robotic systems allow, system allows us very uh, directed and careful dissection. Here we are incising the pleura. And now we are carefully dividing these flimsy tissues that surround the esophagus while, while using a no-touch technique and retracting the lung inferiorly. Now we are completely com uh, finishing mobilization of the esophagus into the mediastinum. And at the time of mediastinoscopy, we placed a little marking uh, uh, gauze, which you will see us retrieve to make certain that we have gone all the way around the esophagus. So this is a little piece of gauze that we left behind that we are going to, it's made of cellulose, uh, that we're going to um, uh, remove to make sure that we've dissected all the way around. You can see the tumor is quite mobile, but obviously our goal is not to enter the esophageal lumen. I'll fast forward this a bit here. Now we have incised the tumor and we're slowly mobilizing it off of the uh, esophageal wall. And as you can see, it's a 13 centimeter tumor that we very carefully in a controlled way can uh, <clears throat> mobilize uh, 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 from the esophageal wall without entering the esophageal lumen. Now the muscular wall of the esophagus is closed with interrupted absorbable sutures. As you can see, the robotic system allows for very controlled uh, suturing without a, uh, much undue uh, a trauma to the uh, affected tissues. 
And here we have, uh, uh, put some saline in the chest because we want to be certain that we did not indeed uh, injure or violate the esophagus. And as such, uh, then we turn our attention to the inside of, of the esophagus and perform an upper endoscopy. And here you'll see on the, here at about one o'clock, this is the trans illuminated uh, operative field that we can see with the endoscope. And we insufflate the esophagus to make sure we don't see egress of uh, uh, air into our field, which uh, we did not. Following uh, uh, assurance that there is no leak, we then close the pleura uh, over uh, the operative site and uh, and there you can see with uh, normal appearing esophagram and nice emptying uh, of the um, of the patient's uh, barium, uh, ingested barium. She was discharged home on post-operative day three, had no complications, and, and returned to her normal life within two weeks of surgery. So when we operate on patients and, uh, and uh, um, uh, do so successfully intraoperatively, we uh, really cannot talk about uh, 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 surgery without uh, talking about our recovery. And again, this has been led by uh, Dr. Don Lowe, and we have enhanced recovery pathways for both uh, robotic uh, esophageal and uh, minimally invasive pulmonary resections. So I would like to take the last few minutes to talk about our outcomes. Uh, we, in addition to ESO data, participate in uh, the Upper GI uh, International Robotic Association. And uh, if you look at our recent publication uh, <clears throat> from the Annals of Surgery, you will see that on average worldwide, uh, uh, comparing uh, me, uh, robotic esophagectomies, uh, 530 uh, Ivor Lewis through the righteous versus three home acute esophagectomies. Uh, the post-operative complication rate worldwide ranges anywhere between 50 and 75 percent. ICU length of stay is anywhere between two, sorry, one and four days. Uh, we are part of this, and we are uh, the the one-day inpatient stay. Uh, our hospital length of stay, the lowest uh, of this of this cohort, was <clears throat> Virginia Mason. We examined our uh, our um, compliance to our enhanced recovery and uh, are submitting this work for publication uh, in the near future. As you can see, uh, out of the last 100 esophagectomies examined, 45% of our patients are able to undergo an enhanced recovery and really uh, uh, be discharged home less than six days in an accelerated fashion. 31 patients uh, uh, are able to achieve, um, or 31% are able to achieve targeted recovery. So overall, really over three quarters of the patients are discharged either in targeted or accelerated fashion. And there's only one uh, quarter of the patients who stay in the hospital in a delayed fashion uh, of which we consider greater than nine days. Although I should know that the average length of stay for an esophagectomy worldwide is about two weeks. Our post-operative complications are about 50%, but the severe complications are only 10%. Examining the, uh, the enhanced recovery components in a more granular way will show you that the, our patients, when we look at the accelerated versus targeted versus delayed recovery groups, our patients uh, are tracking with all the aspects of enhanced recovery for the first two post-operative days. And as you can see, the first day in the ICU, the patient undergoes education regarding their enhanced recovery. The patient is, gets out of bed and sits in chair. There's already a nutrition consult uh, because they get started on enter, enteral tube uh, feeds through their feeding jejunostomy. Post-op day one, the patient is out of bed and ambulates once or twice. And then usually <clears throat> there is a return of bowel function which tracks. The patient meets a social worker. Usually on post-operative day two, after an esophagram, the nasogastric tube is removed. And all of these uh, groups, even the delayed recovery group, track to all these aspects of enhanced recovery. However, presence of complications, then, then uh, even though the patients are still adherent to, 
to the F to every element of the recovery then separates. And that's a very important metric for us to understand because this is where we can put extra resources to, to bring the curve down over time. Looking at our uh, robotic <coughs> uh, lobectomy, uh, we uh, just submitted uh, our uh, analysis of both implementing robotic surgery and enhanced recovery pathways to the Western Thoracic Association. Uh, the blue line is uh, video assisted and black line is robotic lobectomy. When you look at length of stay, you will see that initially, uh, this is only the first two lobectomies we did in 2018, our length of stay has increased, but then has gradually decreased and out outperformed video assisted resection. And really we are to less than two day recovery, which is a nationwide benchmark uh, uh, from 2019 on after uh, uh, implementing and tightening down our enhanced recovery pathway. This is associated with uh, uh, accomplishing our financial goals as well. As you can see, a robotic lobectomy has uh, 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 now financially outperformed uh, uh, video-assisted lobectomy in 2019 and 2020. When we look at uh, uh, the outcomes in a more granular way, you'll see that the length of stay uh, for, if you uh, look, look at all comers in this cohort, 57 video-assisted versus 59 robotic lobectomies, uh, it is uh, two days better. Uh, the chest tube removal time is 31 versus 73 hours. Uh, it is faster uh, by about 30 minutes. Um, and then uh, the, we, had, we had in this cohort no readmissions. However, I, I must admit that just two weeks ago we had to readmit uh, a patient for some air under her skin, which can happen after a lung resection. So, so we do have one readmission now in about 70 patients. Uh, the total cost, is, uh, it, it appears to be about uh, $6,000 cheaper. The inpatient cost by, by virtue of less inpatient stay is, is cheaper by about $3,000. And obviously cost uh, uh, per OR minute is, uh, ch or is cheaper because the surgeries are done at a faster uh, uh, pace. Uh, when you compare our outcomes to uh, to, to, to national, national outcomes of uh, interrogation uh, by, of our STS database and publication in Annals of Thoracic Surgery just two years ago, you'll see that the mean and median length of stay for both robotics and, and video-assisted surgery are uh, about six and five days respectively. Uh, the, the robotic surgery here outperformed uh, video-assisted surgery by, by a small margin as well. Our length of stay is 1.77 days, again, in our cohort, uh, now really 1% readmission rather than 0% readmission. All patients thus far have been discharged home. Now let's, uh, if we look at our all uh, surgical uh, uh, patients who have undergone uh, uh, thoracic operations since 2016 and separated them by decade of life, we can uh, perform an analysis that shows us where the patients go. And as you can see, majority of our patients despite advanced age is being discharged home. There is a component of increasing uh, home health need in uh, septuagenarians and, uh, and octogenarians, as well as need for skilled nursing facility, but it's by far, um, by far a small percentage of patients. Uh, inpatient mortality has been low uh, uh, at less than 1% in all age groups. This type of analysis is very important because it allows us to, to not only uh, look at our own data, but to guide patients when they ask about um, uh, recovery uh, and what it would mean for their particular for their particular age group. Our oncologic outcomes uh, uh, are uh, ex ex exceed uh, uh, national uh, standards. This is uh, interrogation of the SEER and NCDD, NCDB uh, databases with respect to overall lung cancer outcomes uh, uh, for five-year survivorship, lung cancer outcome by stage, and esophageal cancer outcome by stage, uh, all outperform uh, national averages. We've been acknowledged as one of the top hospitals for lung surgery in 2020. So lastly, let's talk about outpatient recovery. All of our inpatient gains uh, come at a cost. Inpatient care is expensive. Outpatient care, we all acknowledge, is less costly. We have looked at uh, the, uh, uh, in the past, we have looked at 
uh, return to activity. If you look at minimally invasive and then video assisted operations versus open operations, you can see that the video assisted operations recover their activity at a faster rate uh, than open operations. However, at 30 days, these two lines converge. Um, outpatient efforts and outpatient resources are extremely important in preventing readmissions. If you look at our readmission rates in 2018, 2019, and 2021, they have gradually decreased. However, they, they spiked from 5.4 to 7.9% in 2020. We try to understand this in a more granular way. And if you examine 2020 and the implications of uh, the pandemic, you will see that we had two spikes of readmission, one in April and one in September. These are likely related to real reallocation of both inpatient and outpatient resources to deal with COVID. And as such, we could not deliver the level of care we are accustomed to in these two uh, parts of 2020. That has been corrected now to thus far in 2021, our readmission rate is uh, 4%. Um, so if I think about the future, uh, what I'll tell you is that just like our Zoom uh, Grand Rounds, uh, enhancements in communication technology are going to equalize, equalize access uh, to care. I think our rural patients will oftentimes have challenges accessing specialty care as they become more and more uh, technologically literate, I think uh, uh, are going to be able to access specialty care in urban settings easier. I do believe that early disease, disease detection through various wearables, like the new iWatch is really um, uh, marketed uh, to detect uh, cardiac dysrhythmias. Uh, Dr. Lowe uh, is em uh, embarking and participating in breath analysis study to detect, to detect esophageal cancers. Uh, there is work being done in the lung cancer space as well. Uh, surgery uh, is going to be uh, augmented by additional visualization tools. Uh, the technology is going to get further and miniaturized. Sorry about the typo. Uh, we are uh, uh, about to embark on uh, transbronchial tumor ablations by a bronchoscopic approach. There is single port robotic surgery on the horizon, and we are also correcting a lot of um, uh, anatomic abnormalities via endoscopic and natural orifice uh, uh, access uh, interventions, uh, such as our transoral incisional fundoplication program, which we have uh, instituted with uh, collaboration with our GI colleagues. And then finally, a lot of the outpatient recovery, which is become, becoming much more prominent, will be enhanced by, by portable technology, enhancing our outpatient perioperative care and detecting postoperative outpatient complications earlier. I have to acknowledge our team, uh, not only the surgeons, but Tina Gender, our physician's assistant, and Luke Katowski, our nurse practitioner, as well as our medical assistants, uh, inpatient nurses, operating room nurses, and all the staff and administrators who allow us to continue in this uh, in, uh, in this endless improvement project. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions.